historian and acclaimed writer Manu S. Pillai disputes this view in a seamless new book, False Allies, India's Maharajas in the Age of Ravi Varma. Through the travels of iconic painter Ravi, Ravi Varma, Pillai uncovers the princely world of legal battle, resistance, industrialization, social and political mobilization in stark contrast to popular history instrumental in the making of modern India. Sashi Tharoor, no stranger, stranger to unpending misinformed notions, has chronicled disruptive histories in works such as An Era of Darkness, The British Empire in India, An Inglorious Empire, What the British Did to India. His most recent book, The Battle of Belonging on Nationalism, Patriotism, and what it means to be Indian is an erudite examination of India's contemporary existential crisis. In conversation with author and historian Ira Makoti, Pillai, and Tharoor come together for a conversation that is sure to galvanize historical perspectives. Manuas Pillai is a critically acclaimed writer and historian who's authored The Ivory Throne, Rebel Sultans, The Courtesan, The Mahatma and the Italian Brahmin, and most recently, False Allies, India's Maharajas in the Age of Ravi Varma. He formerly worked as the Chief of Staff to Sashi Tharoor and has won the Sahitya Academy, Yuva Puriskar. Sashi Tharoor, a third term member of parliament from Tiruvanthampuram, is the best selling author of 23 books, both fiction and non fiction besides being a former Undersecretary General of the United Nations and a former Minister of State for Human Resource Development and for External Affairs in the Government of India. He's won numerous awards, including the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman, a Commonwealth Writers' Prize, and the Crossword Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2019, he was also awarded the Sahitya Academy Award in the category of English Nonfiction for his book, an era of darkness. Ira Makoti is the author of Akbar, the Great Mughal, Daughters of the Sun, Empresses, Queens, and Begums of the Mughal Empire, and Heroines, Powerful Indian Women in Myth and History. She writes rigorously researched narrative histories that are accessible to everyone. Her debut novel, Song of Draupadi, was published in 2021. Over to all the stalwarts here on the dais. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and welcome to everybody this afternoon. Uh, we are in the company of two amazing writers, writers of history, uh, writers of disruptive history, which is something which is so exciting nowadays. Uh, so many, you know, historians and writers taking up this challenge of writing alternative histories, you know, and it seems to show that it's occupying a place that is dear in all of your hearts since there's such a demand. Um, and Manu Pillai in particular has really been at the forefront of this charge, if we may say, uh, right from the beginning, writing about the matrilineal women of the House of Travancore and then the Sultans from the Deccan. You know, we tend to concentrate on, uh, unfortunately, the Mughal Empire and, uh, you know, the North Indian kings. Uh, so Manu has brought us many alternative uh, histories. So I was slightly surprised, it's true Manu, when I saw that your new book, False Allies, uh, was studying the some of the princely states, you know, and in my mind, uh, it this was something that I wasn't terribly proud of. It was an inheritance that I wanted to distance myself from. Uh, there was something almost shameful about it, something effete in the past. And when I read your book, I was thoroughly, thoroughly, uh, you know, challenged by that view. And, uh, you know, the princely states have fallen between, you know, the devil and the dark blue sea because both um, uh, the, 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 Brit the British Raj at that time really made fun of them, characterized them in many ways. And the nationalist movement, the early ones, also wanted to distance themselves from what they saw as a feudal past. So can you tell us a little bit about why you took up this challenge and what you found about them? Well, for the simple reason that 40% of the Indian subcontinent, even under the Raj, was actually under the princely states. Yeah. And the word that we often use is indirect rule, but what that eclipses is that these states or that 40% of India was under Indian rule. There were Indian Rajas with Indian ministers, with Indian bureaucrats ruling over fellow Indians. 
So although there was colonialism, the experience of colonialism in that 40% segment of India was actually very different from what was happening in British India because the white man wasn't a direct sort of presence in the princely states. Um, my grandmother grew up in the princely state of Travancore and you know, they had no political figure higher than the Maharaja. They knew there was the Englishman somewhere outside. They knew about Gandhiji. But beyond that, it was the Maharaja's government that sent them their milk powder to the government school. There was a government school in the village. Uh, there were medical facilities. There were midwives coming for, for, for birth in the 40s and so on. It was pretty well developed for that time. But what is the general stereotype we've got? That, you know, this 40%, there were these Rajas, they lived in these grand palaces. Early in the morning, they'd wake up, they'd oppress their subjects for breakfast. Then they'd watch dancing girls for the rest of the time. And in the evening, they'd get together with the British drink and say, hmm, how do we keep the British Empire going for longer? They were allies of the, of the British Empire. That's the conventional idea. But I call them false allies because there were ways and means by which even the Maharajas actually resisted colonial uh, influence. The British also overstated the kind of influence they had over the Maharajas. In reality, although the British clipped their wings when it came to foreign policy and defense, internally the Maharajas had a lot of power. They had access to money, which they were able to channel into the Congress party. They were able to meet, some of them met with revolutionaries, some of them funded propaganda against the British Raj, and often they would even slight the British on ritual terms. You know, they would have these very interesting contests with the British where ritual became a means of doing politics. Uh, a lot of them, in fact, you know, even contemporary issues of identity, communalism, caste, communal violence in India was higher in British India and lower in the Hindu princely states. Even though the Rajas were officially custodians of Hinduism, you would imagine they were very orthodox. Yet Ian Copeland, the scholar, has shown that communal violence was lower in the princely states. So even in, in, in the 21st century, when we talk of modern Indian history, we can't exclude the 40% that wasn't British India. We can't exclude these aspects of communalism, caste, how colonialism worked out in the princely states. And if a, cl a cliche or a stereotype exists about dancing girls and elephants and, and people being oppressed you know, five times a day, I think the our intention should be to question the cliche, find out the source of the origin of that stereotype, and then look at the princely states from a new perspective. By no means am I saying the princely states were good or bad. It was just that they are politically interesting, and the Rajas didn't just wear silks and sit about uh, all day long. They were also political actors, and if they rode elephants, if they wore those silks and jewels, everything also had political meaning. It wasn't devoid of political meaning. Correct. Um, so on that point, the fact that they were political agents and perhaps even contributed to some of the nationalist causes. Uh, Dr. Thuru, I have a challenge for you here because uh, I know from a recent talk we did that uh, Nehru is one of your idols and great heroic figures. Um, so in his book, Princess Tan, Sandeep Banzai wrote that Nehru and Nehru alone defined the, pub the rubric of sentiment against the princes. Um, and Nehru further defined uh, he said of the princely state, some are hopelessly backward, some steeped in medieval darkness, some are patriarchal, very few maintain good government. Um, can you give us an explanation of the context in which these sort of sentiments reigned and could there have been a more nuanced approach to the princes? I'll explain that, but before I do, let me agree with Manu that uh, this was worth, worth writing, worth studying. And there is indeed a great deal that happened in the princely states that we tend to overlook when we study the history of India. It's, for example, Travancore that Manu mentioned. The Rani, Rani Gauri Parvati Bai, in 1817, made Travancore the first political entity in the world, ahead of England, the United States, everything else, to decree free and universal compulsory education for boys and girls. Okay, and no other place on the planet had that. Uh, and so you had that kind of enlightenment, actually, at some of the, the first Serious movement for Dalit empowerment was in Travancore with Mahatma Yankali, uh, who defied some of the, the rules, prohibitions on dress, on riding bullet carts, on, on using certain roads that Dalits were prohibited from and so on. So these princely states were actually very interesting places where a lot of things like this, like social empowerment, social freedom, uh, social rights movements happened as well. Uh, it's not as if the history of the of India in the years of the British Raj can be reduced or should be reduced only to the British uh, controlled part of the British provinces of India, which is a failing, I think, in other histories. And I think Manu's rendered us a signal service in, in telling us about all of this. Now, on the specific question of Nehru, I mean, his dislike is very clearly anchored 
both in his own intellectual convictions and his personal experience. Intellectually, as you know, he was a socialist and a democrat and an advocate of a united India. And in all three counts, he saw the princely states as the antithesis of what he actually wanted to achieve. So socialism clearly is not going to appeal to Maharajas in principle. Um, democracy wouldn't either. Many of the Maharajas, as Manu pointed out, they ran their own internal affairs with very little interference in the Brits. The Brits thought it was enough for them to control foreign policy uh, and external relations, defense, uh, that sort of thing. But, and of course, currency and revenue, they were happy to collect when the Maharajas handed it over to them. But when it came to internal affairs, the Maharajas, many of them were pretty arbitrary in their decision making. And, uh, and Nehru saw them as emblematic of the anti-democratic feudal tendencies in the country that needed to be overcome. And then unity. You know, there was some talk at some point that the princes could constitute a separate political, you're right, Sandi Banzai calls them Princess Than, um, a separate political entity. Uh, already, there was talk that in a future independent India, at least the prince's authority could be preserved in a, a royal sort of house of lords, house of nobles or princes, rather than, so the Lok Sabha would have been the House of Commons, and all the Rajas together would have constituted the upper house. That was an idea. Nehru would have none of all of that. And he particularly did not want a situation in which any of the princes and their states could maintain direct relations uh, with any external power by which it was understood to be the British power. Because even if paramountcy were to lapse, some in Britain and some amongst the princely states thought that their earlier treaty obligations to each other would warrant a separate relationship. And Nehru, and I might add Patel, was not going to stand for that. They want to completely dissolve these places as viable independent actors. And then Nehru's personal experiences of the princely states. Uh, he had a couple of very nasty episodes. One was uh, Nabha in 1923 when he was arrested and flung into prison. And flung into prison and treated pretty badly. I think it was probably the worst spell of imprisonment he'd gone through. And, um, and you know, when, when he was finally released with a lot of effort, uh, the order passed by Naba was he must not set foot in Naba again or his sentence would automatically have 30 months added to it. So even Mahatma Gandhi pleaded to him, please, you're a hot-headed young man, do not go to Naba. Uh, and then the other one was Farid Kot a few years later. Um, see, Nehru, partially because of Nabha and partially because of his convictions, engineered the founding of something called the Indian People's, uh, Indian States People's Con Congress. The idea was that the Indian National Congress only covered the British Indian territories. But the people of the princely states, how could they be organized to resist both the tyranny of their Maharajas and uh, 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 the cause of freedom from the British? And so he organized the Indian uh, States People's Conference. And... That was in 1927. In 28, he went to support a particular variant of this uh, movement, the Praja Mandal, in Faridkot. And uh, there too, he fell rather afoul of the, of the Maharaja, Harinder Singh. And there was lots of dramas, including a Nehru Harinder pact that granted certain legislative concessions. Uh, Punjabis will tell you there's a major milestone in their democratic evolution. But um, it, it left Nehru all the more convinced that monarchical rule had no place in the future democratic India that he envisaged. So all of these factors came in. But I would concede Manu's point at the same time that to stereotype all princely states as being arbitrary, capricious, dictatorial, inhumane, and all of this stuff um, was probably uh, unfair on Nehru's part because there were all these good things that were also overlooked at the same time. I, I just quickly add to that. It's also the period, really. By the time Nehru comes in, the Maharajas have actually started falling out with the Congress. Because in the 19th century, when Congress came up and there was this whole idea of Indian nationalism, nobody believed it. People thought it was impossible for nationalism to emerge. Nationalism had to be constructed. It, had, it was an intellectual argument to begin with. It was an elite affair after that. And then it was Gandhiji who made it a, a mass movement. The moment it became a mass movement is when the Rajas decided, ah, we don't want this because 
this will then end up threatening our power as well so long as congress was stuck to armchair politics the rajas were funding it dada bhai nauruji's election to the house of commons was funded by the maharaja of baroda uh, congress repeatedly got large sums of money from the maharajas a lot of these regional nationalist cup, clubs like the pune sarvajanik sabha the deccan education society they got large sums of money from the rajas because they were needling the british in the right places and at that point the congress wanted to needle the british they also wanted the prestige of these maharajas because they had a kind of cultural legitimacy and the rajas needed the congress as well to keep the british in check so it was like this arrangement or an alliance between the two but come gandhi ji and come the movement moving to the masses the rajas start to reconsider that position and they do become more and more repressive even in an enlightened state like mysore there was something called vidraswata which was called the south indian jallianwala bag people being shot at by their own government in travancore there was punna pravailar where the communists were shot at with machine guns by their own government something that hadn't happened in 150 years even the enlightened maharajas by the 1940s lost all the sympathy they had from their own people simply because when it came to it they proved that they were enlightened autocrats but they were autocrats they were not uh democrats by any stretch the sound is gone do you want my mic yes uh but manu uh earlier on before the you know 1940s there was a, almost a system in in place to check these sort of excesses and that was the diwan some of them as you have mentioned were extremely well educated they had very forward thinking ideas they were advising these princes uh with with a very clear view of what these princes were like they knew their failings they knew their their you know potential weaknesses and they tried to to bring in uh changes uh, into the system in modernized places so can you tell us about some of these diwan some of the famous ones like madhav rao for example so, you know princely politics was this triangular contest where there were the british on one side there was the raja and then there was the raja's minister the diwan and often these diwans were imported from other parts of india so the diwans of travancore for the longest time were marathi deshastha brahmins who came from tanjavur because they had served in the british bureaucracy they knew the english language so a raja needed somebody who knew english to deal with the british and the raja's incentive was i must preserve my kingship including traditional elements so in travancore they had this hiranyagarbha where the raja sits in a golden cow and gets himself upgraded in caste there's the tulapurushadanam where you weigh yourself in in gold and then distribute it to 15000 brahmins but under colonialism the british began to use these exorbitant or uh, expensive ceremonies as an excuse to interfere in the states so the rajas started realizing that if i'm spending money on feeding 15000 brahmins for my birthday i must spend a larger sum on schools i must spend a larger sum on roads it wasn't some kind of altruistic idea that that motivated them it was self interest so again the book doesn't argue that they were somehow you know uh, large minded souls who saw the big picture no they wanted to preserve their turf so they modernized to the extent it suited them but not beyond that the divans on the other hand they were career bureaucrats they came in and they realized we're going to make our mark here because my next employment in another princely state depends on how successful i am here so the divan had an incentive to test the raja's authority and try and turn the raja into a constitutional head so that educated elite indians who spoke english could govern including congress leaders you know rc dutt for example who was a congress president was divan of baroda after that because the baroda government had need for men like that who had that kind of exposure and finally there were the british the british could at one point try and ally with the maharaja against the divan on other occasions they'd ally with the divan against the maharaja since we are in jaipur the 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 rulers came up with all kinds of creative ways of of trying to challenge this uh, maharaj of jaipur called ram singh who died around 1880 very shrewd man you know he was there from the time of the 1857 rebellion for several years after he would modernize to the extent that it suited him so yes to railways yes to roads in his core territories yes to street lamps girl school uh, hospital whatever everything was started what he did not modernize was his revenue uh, management for the simple reason that revenue uh, but jaipur's treaty with the british was that any revenue over 40 lakhs the british would get a cut so the maharaja by not modernizing his revenue collection kept them in the dark about how much money he was actually getting so for years and years and years his revenue was always 38 lakhs 39 lakhs 39 and a half lakhs it never crossed 40 lakhs whereas in reality it was close to 60 lakhs simply because he was able to fudge his accounts that way and the british knew this so even modernization with the divans was a very political process as to exactly how far you want to modernize and to what extent a state like travancore put out these long reports about how much revenue it had how many schools it had started there were exaggerations in that because they knew we have to like excel and and sort of surpass the british at progress progress in courts so if you're more progressive even than the british the british have no 
incentive to come and interfere in your state. They have no excuse. So a lot of the progress was also fudged. So a lot of the reports, a lot of the official statistics, this happens to this day. Our current government also does it, where you have like reports being fudged and numbers and statistics becoming a political subject. You know, it isn't purely about the numbers. So you have that in the princely states as well. So the Divans, of course, uh, Sir T. Madhav Rao being one of the more uh, important ones of that time. He served in Travancore, he served in Baroda, he served in Indore, and he want to, also wanted to go and serve in Mysore. One man, you know, the uh, multiple divans of Travancore came out of one school just because they spoke good English there. They had uh, contacts in Madras. Madhav Rao, Sheshaya Shastri, Ramayangar, all of them classmates. Madhav Rao's son goes and becomes divan of Mysore. Uh, Sheshaya Shastri then goes to Pudukote. So it's one small set of educated English-speaking men who are moving from one princely state to the other, reforming it. And they are reforming it because they're very aware. And they're all Brahmins, of course. They're all Brahmins. A large chunk of them are, are Marathi, Deshastha Brahmins. And but their incentive is, there is a nationalistic element to their incentive in all this, which is that they want to prove that if Indian ruled India can be run well, if a Raja has a good government, the people have schools, people have roads, then the British excuse that they are here to civilize Indians, they are here to give Indians the railways, all of that falls flat. So when, when a Travancore has a greater sort of uh, density of population, of, uh, density of schools or whatever available to its people, and the British district next to it doesn't, it's a moral statement against the Raj as well. And they were playing that game. You know, and you, you see this in their writings as well. They were very keen to protect the princely states because what they called native pride was attached to the survival of the princely states. As I said, it's only by the 1920s that this shifts. And the Maharajas still then were seen very much as icons by somebody as, even like Gandhiji. Gandhiji was the son of a, of a princely minister. He himself came up from a princely state. As late as 1929, Sardar Patel in, in Mysore, there was agitation against the Maharaja and Patel in a speech there said, you have such a wonderful Maharaja, you have such a wonderful government that's doing so much. If you're still not satisfied, there's something wrong with you, the people of Mysore. It's the same Sardar Patel who by 1949 shifts and says the princely states are ulcers that have to be excised and the nation has to be united naturally because the political conditions have changed. The princes have become repressive and they can become, as Dr. Thurur was saying, islands within India that could be used for anti-India uh, purposes. But yeah, it's a, it's a complicated story for that reason. Hyderabad, you know, the, it's called the police action, but it was actually an invasion. There was aerial bombing and between what, 28,000 to 40,000 people were killed in the violence that followed. The Indian government acknowledged 3,000 because 3,000 pensions were paid. But Hyderabad had to be taken over militarily in the, in the late 1940s. The princely states are relevant also because they affect our politics and, and, and international relations also to a certain extent. Kashmir was a princely state. Communal relations in Kashmir, the Pandit problem, the Muslim problem, all of those go back to princely policies under the Dogras. When, when China went in and, and seized Tibet, uh, Nirupama Rao's uh, new book, she talks about how one of the reasons India had to be slightly cautious about its wording was that they were afraid, the Indian government was afraid that our takeover of Hyderabad would be, then be used against us. That would become a point in the UN or wherever, which it was. Somebody tried to raise it in the UN. And, and that would become a problem if we try to say, become too sort of moralistic about Chinese actions in Tibet. So princely states ended up having this strange impact even on these larger debates and larger issues that were happening at that time. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Dr. Thuru, some insights into how we are still being affected in some way by our these past relations? Well, I mean, the fact is these princely states, of course, had their own uh, treaty relationships with, with the Brits. And when they were all dissolved, we tried to create a united nation. It, it didn't just happen overnight. So, for example, in Punjab, you had the Patiala and, uh, and uh, East Punjab States Union, which was a collection of princely states, uh, which then eventually had to be dissolved into what became Punjab State and then was broken up into Punjab, Haryana and Himachal. The political process of, of, of the legacies of these states has varied from place to place. Very few princely states simply survived uh, in the form in which they were. Of course, Rajasthan was created, first Rajputana, then Rajasthan. Um, Mysore became part of this larger uh, entity called Mysore State, which included Bangalore, which is actually a British cantonment town, and now Karnataka, and so on and so forth. So it was a, it was a complicated process. But one thing that Nehru and Patel were absolutely clear about was there would be no trappings of independent decision making. It's, it's, it's amazing, for example, that Travancore actually sought to be independent in August 15, 1947. And they even sent an envoy to Delhi 
Nehru sent him packing. Uh, but they weren't, in, they weren't in direct contact with Jinnah. Jinnah wanted to have a diplomatic relationship with Travancore. Uh, by the way, the reason Travancore is coming up so much is I'm the MP from there, from Tiruvannantapuram, which is where, um, where, where which was the, the biggest city of, of Travancore at the time. The point is that many of these kings had ambitions, and, and, and these ambitions went right up to uh, the moment of independence, almost. Uh, then you've got Kashmir, of course, Manu's mentioned it. Uh, there's a story that in the 1890s, uh, the British had seriously sought to, uh, thought of annexing Kashmir to British India. And that the Maharaja of Kashmir had actually traveled to London and lobby to save his state. But can you imagine what would have happened if the British had annexed it? Uh, because obviously it would have fallen victim to Cyril Radcliffe's partition pen in a way that it didn't when the princely state as a state acceded to India. So there are all these histories and, and, and legacies and complications emerging from all of this. One of the reasons we finally last year had a territorial settlement with Bangladesh is because there were about 150 enclaves uh, in each other's countries after partition, right up to, to for 70 years after partition, where there were bits of territory in what is what we think of as India that were actually part of Bangladeshi sovereignty, but over which the Bangladeshis could exercise no control. And similarly, Indian enclaves in Bangladesh, over which we could exercise no control. And some of these had come about literally through the gambling of princes. I mean, they would literally wager entire villages and half a district and so on, lose. And then suddenly this, this chunk belongs to the chap on the other side. And vice versa. It, it, you really had some amazing messes. And in some ways, the process of clarifying our borders has not yet been settled. We still have an undefined, um, uh, you know, we don't have an internationally agreed border in Kashmir. We has, still have an undefined uh, line of control in the north with Tibet and China. So all of these things suggest that the processes of political line drawing, um, complicated by the princely states to begin with, are still a lingering concern in, in contemporary India. Absolutely. Uh, Manu, I wanted to come to the structure of the book uh, because, you know, when you were setting out to write these biographies of these princes, there are so many princely states, some, you know, 350 to 400, I'm not sure exactly how many. And these are not just independent essays on, you know, what these uh, kings were up to. You actually use the life of Raja Ravi Varma, which I found one of the most fascinating aspects of your book, because you bring out the life of this man, this painter who has shaped the you know, Indian perception of Indianness to such a large degree. And you trace his journey through these different states, and that's how you link all these stories together. So tell us a little bit about this painter and how you chose these states. Well, he was a princely insider, right? The thing is, he was born in a princely state. His sisters-in-law and his granddaughters were Maharani's of Travancore. So he's very much part of that universe. The other thing is the portraits he did. That's why I cover the five princely states where he went and did portraits. Portraits are not just about the likeness of the ruler. It's political communication. It's about how the ruler wants to be seen by his subjects, by people, by the British who are coming and dealing with him. For example, you know, there's a picture of, um, and, and the portraits conceal a great deal. You know, there's a Pudukote Raja's picture where the Raja stands very nicely, very grandly. Uh, in the background, you'll see that he's actually a very weak ruler, but in his painting, he can look like a very strong ruler. In the background, you'll see a temple, which is supposed to signify his family connection, religion, the Hindu idea of kingship. But his hand also rests on the spine of an English book by which he's signaling that I'm also comfortable in English. I'm also a man of the modern world. I begin the book with a portrait of a, a young prince who's sitting on one of those giant tricycles, a very posh uh, thing to have in the, in the late 19th century. And he's wearing English clothes, except for ear studs and a, and a little cap. And his, his whole point is that, look, I'm very much like the cosmopolitan who's who of the world. Just because I'm uh, an in quotes native, you know, I, I don't, you can't deny me that personality. So there's a kind of engagement with modernity also in these paintings. But the paintings also conceal a great deal. So a portrait of Sayaji Rao Gaikwad of Baroda, he's, he's holding a sword. And the, I think the, the hilt of the sword is, or the scabbard, I think, has a portrait of the Viceroy. And he's wearing a medal that the British have given him. There's all kinds of things that suggest that he's this very pro-British kind of figure. Uh, you know, that's the image you get from the painting. But actually, the British called him a patron of sedition because in his long, many decades of his, of his reign, he was actually pointedly anti-British. This also, you know, questions our idea of where these Maharajas came from. Often the royal families didn't have heirs. They had this perpetual uh, conundrum of running out of heirs and then they had to adopt people. This chap, for example, Sayajara Gaikwad, till he was 12 years old, he used to live in a village near Nasik in Bombay presidency, working on a field, was completely illiterate. At that time, then Maharaj of Baroda toppled for completely different reasons. 
and they decide we need to find somebody suitable malleable that is malleable in the sense that the, the maharani of baroda can control him as well as the british so they single out this distant relative this 12 year old boy bring him to baroda and the british are bombarding him with lessons in loyalty the maharani is trying to control him on the other side her adopted son and they think that he's going to grow into this very loyal british prince and that painting was made then at the age of 19 when he was appointed maharaja he's wearing the medals he's got the sword he's signaling his loyalty to the british raj in reality of course in the decades that follow this is not what he does he's in contact with jyotiba phule in pune he's in contact with the the congress politicians in Mar- in in pune and bombay he's uh, funding the congress party he's funding dada bhai nauru ji's election he's funding even bomb manuals and revolutionary material in his state and it's it's printed under these very innocent titles like vegetable medicines you know so the, on on the face of it you can't tell he's it's actually a bomb manual and he's very shrewd and this is where the raja's power also shows the british the bombay police actually came into baroda and raided and they found some of this contraband material and instead of you know the raja saying oops i'm sorry you've caught me the raja said hold on this is my jurisdiction on whose permission did you enter baroda to get the evidence you've entered baroda without authorization so none of this has any value he kept standing up to the british repeatedly uh, one of the one of the british princes visited and you know they they said you must be in baroda to receive him and he said i'm not a servant to stand here receiving and he went on a european holiday to avoid meeting this chap whenever he traveled abroad he met the uh, madam kama uh, uh, krishna uh, shamji krishna varma bunch of revolutionaries and others finally he also 19- financed uh, dr ambedkar he did his abroad. education and in fact one of the first draft constitutions in india was written in a princely state by sir t madhav rao but he was finally cornered by the british in 1911 30 years of doing this of being patently anti british in 1911 the man is cornered because there's this grand darbar in delhi and the king and queen of england uh, of, of great britain are here and the rajas are all supposed to go up bow to them three times and then walk backwards without showing the the king of england their backs this chap the story goes he walked up swinging his cane gave a sort of cursory nod of his head turned around and then swinging his cane walked back to his seat there are exaggerations a lot of rajas did that so it wasn't like he he deliberately offended them that was the claim at least but it wasn't believed it was felt that this was the final uh, thing this was just you know the, the straw that broke the camel's back this is too much funding revolutionaries is also okay but turning your back on the king of england is not that's when he was threatened finally with this so the, the paintings and the portraits ravi varma has done they conceal a lot of these stories they conceal a lot of politics they conceal a lot of political communication a lot of what the rajas were trying to signal to their people all of that and ravi varma is a great charismatic thread through which to weave these stories so that readers have one single thread running through the book and it's not scattered essays as you were saying no it makes it absolutely fascinating and i think sajji rao um is that the one in which there are two portraits one when he is freshly i think uh, you know brought in and you can see from the painting he's this sulky looking teenager you know he looks like oh, you know where have they brought me i was quite happy in my village you know illiterate and not having to go to school and he's sitting like hunched down like this and the next painting is the one you described he looks very kingly in fact he looks quite regal and composed so it's um you know it's always very interesting to see the power that paintings do have and how much do you think the the patron knew about these symbols how much did he did he say place that uh, you know book in english so that my hand very is much. on it or, or did the painter take that decision? no no very much he was very few princes i mean in mar in in, in rajputana for example fateh singh of udaipur he was very clear no british medals no books nothing to do with the english language he stood with a sh- sword and a shield very much like his rajput ancestors in old miniature paintings and got himself painted like that because his form of resisting the british was simply to resist any modernization if you spoke english the raja didn't like you it was as simple as that he would in fact the number of roads that exist in udaipur fell in his reign because he said the british have made a cult out of progress and development i don't need to do that i am not going to work on their terms in a sense you know i one would say that perhaps his mind was not colonized by some of these ideas of progress or whatever but he said absolutely not my ancestors ruled without roads we will i continue to rule without roads what's interesting is that it's not as if the subjects of the princes were completely meek they had agency as well when fateh singh was toppled it was not by the british even lord curzon who hated all the princes when he came to fateh singh he was very reverential and very coy because fateh singh had this great rajput aura and the british were a bit in awe of of the rajputs but when fateh singh was toppled it was by his people because again princely subjects were not meek it was tribal resistance and peasant resistance that pushed him off the throne so again you know rajas 
a political raja is not really sitting in his palace giving arbitrary orders there's pressure from the british well, there's some the pressure did. some of them did but not all of them could because there's pressure from the british there's pressure from your own diwan your own nobles who you have to keep in check and there are your subjects your subjects are not sitting there taking your oppression uh, you know as you're dishing it out the subjects were capable of going behind the rajas back and joining up with the british to kick the raja off his throne which happened in in mysore in the early 19th century so it it's actually much more complicated and layered and of course uh, you know you've probably read about the women in the book as well which <laughs> we haven't talked about i was about to say something about women <laughs> you read my mind but actually it's to do with raja ravi varma because you know uh, i was fascinated to read that uh, at that time when he started painting uh, images from the the epics and the puranas he was actually creating a modern idea of what a female beauty for example what the gods and goddesses were supposed to look like um and you know today i have often used those images as a critique to say he showed all women as very beautiful fair of a caste brahmin women you know and we need to push back against that but in I his mean, own time he Lakshmi was not like parvati and saraswati are all wearing high necked blouses and so on <laughs> and he's a man who came from kerala where till the 1940s men women nobody wore anything above the waist toplessness was the norm even for women most people are surprised by this but that was the norm my favorite stories in my own family my great grandmother was middle aged when she got a blouse for the first time by her son in law's mother he she gave it as a present and the story goes she wore and wore it in front of a mirror looked at herself admired herself and they said now why don't you come out and show everybody and she said oh no how can i go in front of my father and my brothers with a blouse on you know it's so it's so obscene to wear a blouse in front of your elders you know that was the culture ravi varma came from but because of victorian influences because of this fair skin orientation that came in in the 19th century the women became these very coy delicate figures who in some ways needed to be rescued by men the portraits are different though the ranis he's painted there's real fire in their eyes his mother in law especially his mother in law of course is a different i mean i got into some trouble because i uncovered that she was caught in the scandal his ravi orma's mother in law in a murder scandal where uh, she apparently had a lover and her husband beat the lover to death with a jackfruit quite a colorful story uh, the a lot of his Actually, descendants were leading. a lot of his descendants were very upset with this little nugget i was able to dig out but the rani is you know and, and their forms of resistance are all interesting uh, rani of pudukote she's got this divan who's come in a tambram she's from the color caste color is what the british called a criminal tribe you know robber caste they you know uh, congenital robbers that was the kind of line the british took about the colors and this brahmin divan comes in and tries to brahminize them you know you must become vegetarians you must give up liquor basically give up your culture so one of his reforms is that the devdasis who come and serve the women in the palace he physically locks up a door to prevent their access not be around around bad women but from the perspective of the queens they are sitting in a palace largely in parda devdasis are dancing girls who dance in the temple they dance in the houses of important men they are a source of information these women who know exactly what's happening in the households in the temples in the markets are communicating intelligence and knowledge to the ranis and that's how the ranis know what's happening in their own capital what's happening in their city by cutting off the devadasis in the name of some moral issue you're actually cutting off their political influence parda is the other thing here in jaipur in the 19th century there was a rani where uh, there was a regency for a little prince and she was the regent and the british resident said oh i must come have you know dealings with you political decisions and she said no 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 parda parda because you know i'm a parda lady but she had no issues keeping up parda with her own courtiers with her noblemen they had free access to her in jamnabai of 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 baroda in the late 19th century she threw off parda when the prince of wales came because she wanted to show that she was an a, an important power in that state she escorted him all the way to the door of the palace went to bombay and met him uh, without parda because parda was very much negotiable it wasn't like they were all lying behind parda oppressed by their men or in some kind of sensuous setting or sort of weeping all day long no parda could be used strategically sometimes to keep the british out and sometimes to keep the allies of your family in so the women are also interesting in how they negotiate politics in these prince face settings Absolutely. i think we just have 5 minutes left yes, for questions we do. so, so we we'll only... wrap it up there i think and there must be so many questions for dr tarur and manu pele uh, let's have it i can choose oh i can choose the lady in the red in the front there um good evening uh, my question is for uh, mr pillai um you spoke of powerful women and uh, ravi raja ravi varma's paintings um there is a specific painting that comes to mind when you speak of that that is of ganga and shantanu how in your understanding of all this how do you, how would you evaluate that particular painting in communicating powerful women and their role in history or even mythology for that matter 
I mean, this is the one where she's sort of on the river saying bye to him, right? I mean, that at least he's true to the story. Of course, as Ira was saying, he's made her fairer, he's given her certain features of a certain kind, etc. But in the story, Ganga has got authority, she's got agency. Therefore, that Ganga is pretty strong. It's in a n- number of other paintings that, you know, there's a little bit of mischief. Shakuntala, for example, the Mahabharata Shakuntala is a very strong woman. But in Ravi Varma's paintings, which is derived from Kalidasa's Abhidhyana Shakuntalam, the character is much more coy, much more delicate, too much, you know, very powerful, does not say anything to men directly, that kind of personality. I think he was aware of this. Uh, he was also aware that painting these mythological figures had some kind of a national purpose. In fact, Sati Madhav Rao, the Divan of Travancore, in the early 1880s told him that these paintings you do, India is very divided. India has different costumes, cultures, even bathing styles. Everything is different. The one common fashion are the epics. Everybody everywhere has heard of Rama, Sita, Ganga. So if you paint them, you're helping create a national imagery. And therefore, you must also produce prints for mass consumption and all of that. So these images were made with the artist very conscious of the fact that he was catering not just to a regular buyer of art or a regular, you know, it wasn't just a business. It had some kind of la- larger purpose to it. So yeah, I mean, so depending on whatever the cultural mode and cultural sort of uh, idea of these women was at that time, as I said, he had to depict Lakshmi Saraswati Parvati in high neck blouses then, because by that time, that's how women were expected to behave. He actually went on a tour of India and saw sculptures and all the sculptures showed topless women. And he realized, I can't paint this in the 19th century. And therefore, he sort of westernized his goddesses as well. Fascinating. Uh, the young man in the front there. Uh, thank you, ma'am. This question is for uh, Sir, Mr. Thadu. Sir, actually, uh, since Sir is talking about how Congress and the royal family's relation was there, recently I read that uh, many courtesans which were associated with royal families, they wanted to help the Congress during the moment, but they weren't allowed by Gandhi especially because he said he didn't want any help from women who were in that kind of a business. So was that also some sort of related to how Congress and the royal family started falling apart from each other? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, Gandhiji had his own personal and somewhat quirky moral standards. So, I mean, you know, he, this was a personal preference. I wouldn't be surprised if others were trying to get access to the information in any case. The truth is there was an enormous amount of valuable intelligence that could be gleaned from these, uh, from these people and from others in the court. Not only them, there were also domestic servants, staff, waiters, cooks. I mean, you know, secrets were collected from multiple sources. And I must say that when you think about the Congress's involvement, with the state's people's conference. The idea was very much to stir up a certain amount of political consciousness in the states. Many of these princely states that uh, Manu is talking about actually had mass movements, <coughs> which were as much against the British as against the Maharajas. And some Maharajas and their Diwans were particularly repressive because they sensed that if, these, if, they, if they indulged in this, it would also affect them. And so, for example, uh, again, going back to Travancore, the Indian National Congress's attempts uh, in Travancore to open a branch there and try and stir up the masses did result in some incidents of shooting and even killing of protesters. I think we have time for one last question uh, right in the front row there. Hello, uh, I have a question regarding uh, how you portrayed the Maharajas in the book. And as you said, as you opened the talk, when you said, I have not portrayed a positive or a negative image, but tried to be very neutral. And then I uh, kind of inclined towards Dr. Theroux's comment that in British history, they don't really teach us about, they don't teach them about the Kanolia, uh India, what atrocities they actually befallen on the Indians. And similarly, over here, we're not really taught about the atrocities and the oppressions um, coming from Rajasthan. Someone would say, oh, I'm very proud of the Maharajas. That, you know, the Rani's and we have, uh, we've just pulled that for a millennium. Um, how much of that should be a part of our regular learnings? Um, not a research, but like in the coursework and how much of that should be left out not to deflect from the brand JLF or brand Rajasthan that we are portraying here. I mean, I think it's important to study everything from all angles for the simple reason that, you know, uh, there's multiple things happening at, at any given time. What happened really with the Rajas is that till independence, the British required this stereotype to keep up their own idea that they were here to civilize India. So if you acknowledge that the Rajas are good, you can't do that. So that's also why Rajas like the Maharaja of Mysore wanted to build uh, an institute of science, one of the biggest dams in the world, big industrial iron and steel works, because they were trying to tell the British, actually, your stereotype doesn't hold. We're going to pump money into this, make losses on this. Crows and crows were lost in these schemes, but we're going to do it to make a point. 
what happens after independence is as i said in the 1930s and 40s because the rajas became more and more repressive and they fell afoul of the congress the same stereotype was inherited and perpetuated by the congress after independence especially after indira gandhi's socialist turn in the late 1960s i begin with a quote from mrs gandhi uh, right at the start of the book where she says go ask your rajas what they did uh, when they were in power ask them how many roads they built wells they dug and the grand uh, some of their achievements is zero something along those lines that was again a political statement it was made in a context where the privy purses given to the rajas was being used by the rajas to support opposition parties that were anti congress so there was politics which again gave the rajas a bad name the third thing is that a lot of rajas once everything went their privy purses went politics went power went what did they have left their art their palaces and this whole exotic idea so they themselves then used that exotic idea to build a kind of tourism brand or whatever and so these rituals are done there's a kind of building of that brand to keep alive that kind of public space you know that, that their presence in the in the public space so the stereotype everybody's used the stereotype including the rajas at different moments that's why we don't hear of them in this very layered kind of way in our usual narratives and textbooks and so on thank you very much manu i think we're going to have to wrap that up now thank you to everybody for being such an engaged audience thank you manu thank Pillai. you ira for the question thank you thank you dr thank you dr thiru please. please buy the book and you can get it signed by manu thank you on that note we'd like to thank thank manu is pillai sashi tharoor and ira mukoti we thank red fm for their support i like sashi the idea of being color coordinated <laughs> that pretty much keeps the festival sense of passion very high in the waste bins placed across the del clarsa mayor We thank our furniture and decor partners Anantaya and AKFT for setting up the author's lounge and the main stage backdrop an interdisciplinary UNESCO award winning lifestyle and furniture design enterprise developing meaningful products promoting crafts and impacting artisanal life do not miss the Anantaya and AKFT booth at the festival marketplace please visit the festival bazaar and the pool bazaar which empowers small scale artisans crafts people and young entrepreneurs in the handcrafted space and are teaming with textile stationery apparel jewelry footwear lifestyle home decor and utilities manu espilai will be signing his book in the authors lounge located right below the seating arrangement at the front lawns I hope you all are having a great time at the 15th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival. We'll be right back with our next session in a few minutes. <laughs>